right, welcome back, or if it's your first time here, welcome. Today's video is crazy. I can't believe I was never taught this in any of my history classes. If I was a history teacher, which I actually wanted to be at one point in my life, I definitely would have found the time to squeeze in this story. Before we jump into today's moment in food history, which involves Boston, a flood, and molasses, hi, my name is Morgan, and I create lots of different food content on here. I have lots of series like Food Fails, Reddit Stories, but I'm also over on TikTok and Instagram where I go by the handle Morgan Chomps. I'll link those below. I'm very active on those platforms. So with that intro stuff out of the way, maybe get that molasses out of your cupboard, bake some nice ginger snaps or chewy molasses cookies, let that good aroma envelop you, and settle in. Let's learn about the Great Molasses Flood that took place in Boston, Massachusetts. Let's start with the lead-up to this disaster that was actually devastating. I know it might sound wild or even funny, but this was a devastating, can't quite say natural disaster, but a devastating disaster at that. The first question I asked myself when I heard of this event was, why was there so much molasses in Boston to even start a flood in the first place? As it turns out, five years previous to the Great Molasses Flood, so in 1914, molasses was hitting its peak popularity in the U.S. Because as it turns out, molasses is a pretty versatile substance. It was an extremely popular sweetener at the time because it's both delicious and it was cheaper than white granulated sugar, and fermented molasses can also be made into industrial alcohol like rum. And even further off the cuff, molasses can be made into wartime products. This is especially important in this context because World War I is raging in Europe around this time, thus creating a larger demand for molasses in weapon making. A key thing to note though, molasses itself is not explosive. It's just a product that one can distill and add to other things to make an explosive. With the war raging in Europe and the general population using molasses as a baking staple, America needed a lot of molasses in the 1910s. Even when World War I ended in 1918, molasses was still in high demand for baking and alcoholic products. This is where we begin to see the lead-up to the disaster that would unfold. So, let's head to Boston in the year 1919 and the tank that would start this whole sticky mess. The United States Industrial Alcohol Building was situated on Commercial Street, in the north end part of Boston, Massachusetts, near the waterfront. This was the heart of the city. The building was operated by the Purity Distilling Company in 1915. A tank was built on the property that was absolutely huge in size. The tank stood at about 58 feet in height and had a diameter of 90 feet. It could hold up to 2.5 million gallons of molasses, and to put that into perspective, that's enough to fill three and a half Olympic-sized swimming pools. Well, the tank immediately had issues. It would often leak and loud rumbling noises could be heard coming from the tank. That would be unsettling to hear, to put it mildly. Nobody really did anything about this, though. It just continued to be used to store millions of gallons of molasses. No big deal, right? This is where the Jaws theme music should start playing in your head. So about two days before the disaster would take place, molasses had been added to the tank. But this batch was warmer than the molasses that was typically added to the tank. This means that this batch was runnier and less thick than typical molasses. Because we all know that when thicker liquid is warmed up, it becomes, well, more liquidy. Excuse my horrible wording. All I'm thinking about is that scene from Spongebob where Patrick and Spongebob are like, Spongebob, look, what is that? It's a liquid. No, Patrick, it's a solid. It's, it's a, a lol squid. squid. What you should take from this is that this batch of molasses was warmer than usual. That'll play into how the molasses spread and flooded part of the city. Now for the event itself, the Great Molasses Flood. On January 15th, 1919, at about 12.30 p.m., a patrolman for the Boston police named Fred McManus was at a call box. As he was trying to report back to his police headquarters, he hears a loud noise. This noise obviously catches his attention, and he turns to have what I imagine to be the shock of his life. He somehow manages to stay composed enough to report back to the dispatcher at headquarters. Send all available rescue vehicles and personnel immediately. There's a wave of molasses coming down Commercial Street. The noise McManus had heard was the sound of the massive storage tank literally bursting at its seams. The bolts holding the bottom of the tank together had shot out of their fastenings, expelling millions of gallons of molasses. 
The first to fall victim to this fiery hot rush of molasses were the workers at the U.S. Industrial Alcohol Building, where the tank was located. The workers that were in the building cellar at the time had absolutely zero chance of escape, and they sadly succumbed to the molasses that was burying them alive. Now, all that molasses was rushing through the city at a crazy speed. The saying slow as molasses clearly did not apply to this situation, because the 2.3 million gallon wave was rushing through Boston city blocks at 35 miles per hour. The waves were 160 feet wide and fluctuating between 15 to 40 feet in height. It is estimated that all of this molasses weighed in at 13,000 short tons. This molasses essentially destroyed everything in its path. And to make matters worse, the north end of Boston was densely populated. Again, this was the heart of the city. The people who were caught in this destructive path were completely engulfed. They were drowning and suffocating in this thick substance. I mean, these victims were basically swallowed by this wave. It's reported that within seconds, two city blocks were flooded. One firefighter recounted that when the wave hit his Engine 31 firehouse, the firehouse was almost ripped from its foundation and swept into the Boston Harbor. It ended up just getting knocked over. This substance was not messing around. This sweet, sticky death, as one person described it, leveled several other buildings and completely decimated many automobiles. As the tsunami of molasses was making its way through the city, it started to cool and thicken because of the cool winter Boston temperatures. Now, you might be thinking, this was a good thing. The thicker the molasses is, the slower it'll spread, right? Well, the damage had already been done, and now that the molasses was hardening, it was actually further trapping its victims. You had people now caught in molasses. They could not move, and gradually, they'd become submerged and drown. The molasses went into people's mouths, noses, ears. They couldn't breathe. Kind of like if you can imagine cement being poured over many city blocks, then it quickly starting to harden. Now you can kind of picture how that would create even more of a problem with the molasses hardening. This meant that rescue efforts were hampered and the people who had become trapped by the sticky wave were now more likely to suffocate because they were stuck. By the time the sun finally fell on January 15th, 21 people were dead and approximately 150 people were injured, and the north end of Boston looked like it had been bombed. This absolute mess took two weeks to clean up. It was documented that things like telephones, subway platforms, and park benches still had traces of sticky molasses weeks after the event. Local folklore tells us that decades later, the area still smelled of molasses from time to time, especially on hot summer days. I mean, we all know how pungent molasses is. So, what exactly went wrong to cause such a disaster? How did we get to this place where people are being buried alive and suffocating because of molasses? I mentioned at the start of this video that this tank had been having issues since the beginning. And there was that thing about the warmer temperature of the molasses a few days before. What finally went wrong, though? There were many structural inadequacies and many signs of negligence were found during the ensuing investigation. So buckle up because the sheer amount of tactics that were employed to keep this tank looking like it was in working order is crazy. First, the tank was built very quickly in 1915 in order to accommodate the country's rising need for molasses. And this tank was put to use right away, meaning no inspections took place once the tank was finished. And the tank wasn't even filled with something like water first to check for any leaks or structural issues. It is believed that this tank leaked since its first day of use. When these leaks were found, instead of fixing them, the tank was just painted brown in order to camouflage the leaking molasses. Now, every time this tank was filled, a loud groaning noise would be heard. Again, very unsettling, and the list keeps going on. There were obvious cracks in the tank, the steel walls of the tank weren't even thick enough to be holding the weight of this molasses. These steel walls were only as half as thick as they should have been. There was also found to be a flawed rivet design in this tank, meaning the literal nuts and bolts that were holding the tank together could not properly support the strain that the molasses was going to put on it. The steel that the tank was made out of also contributed to the tank's weakness because the steel had been mixed with too little of a substance known as manganese meaning the metal slowly became more and more brittle as it was exposed to higher temperatures. Essentially, the warm molasses was slowly eating away at the metal itself. The final issue I'll mention is the problem concerning carbon monoxide. 
Because molasses ferments and it gives off carbon monoxide, which can raise the internal pressure of the tank, as you can guess, added pressure and poor structural integrity do not mix. This tank was clearly, very obviously, not in good shape, and residents nearby knew it. Children would actually bring cups from home to collect the molasses that was dripping from the tank. So with all of those issues being laid out on the table, what was the last straw that broke the camel's back? Researchers believed that it was the higher temperature of the molasses and the filling of the tank a couple days previous to the disaster that finally wore the tank down to its literal breaking point. The new, warmer batch of molasses that had been added to the tank led to a thermal expansion of the sticky substance. This was enough to just rupture the dilapidated tank. Who is to blame for this mess? It's not hard to deduce. Purity Distilling Company and the U.S. Industrial Alcohol Company. Yet, here's the wild thing. At first, the Purity Distilling Company tried to blame anarchists. They claimed that anarchists had blown up the tank, meaning the explosion wasn't due to anything wrong with the tank itself. It was anarchists. Over 100 lawsuits ended up being filed, and across all of these judicial proceedings, 3,000 witnesses were called and 45,000 pages of testimony were recorded. There was clearly a lot of evidence against the Purity Distilling Company and the U.S. Industrial Alcohol Company that just couldn't be denied. With there being little to no inspections, poor structural integrity from the beginning, and with the entire list of problems we just discussed, in the end, the Purity Distilling Company was ordered to pay about $7,000 per victim, which is about equal to $100,000 per victim today. Overall, I'm glad that these companies were found guilty for being to blame. Yes, of course, no amount of money can ever replace somebody's life, but I'm glad their attempts at blame shifting didn't work. But this is also a tragedy that could have been prevented if it had not been for greed and just an outright denial of the facts. And on that note, I think that's going to do it. I hope you enjoyed learning about the Great Molasses Flood. I'd like to think I know a fair bit of history, especially U.S. history, and I had never heard of this event until a year or so ago. If this kind of content interests you, please consider liking, consider subscribing. I'd really appreciate it. Don't forget to check out my TikTok and Instagram. The links for those are below. I do lots of taste tests. I share amazing food finds, food deals, all sorts of great stuff. So definitely worth a scroll. That's all I have for today. So have a great day. Stay safe. Eat something yummy. And I'll see you in the next one.